So, good evening. My name's uh, Randall Hansen. I'm interim director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and permanent director of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, which is also at the Monk School. It's my great pleasure to introduce the chair of this evening's proceedings, Professor Piotr Wrobel. Professor Wrobel holds the Konstanty Reinhardt Chair of Polish Studies here at the University of Toronto. Prior to his appointment in 1994, he taught Polish, modern European, German, and Russian history at the universities of Warsaw, Michigan, Michigan State, and the University of California at Davis. He obtained his PhD from the University of Warsaw, and he's been a visiting scholar at the Institute for European History at Mainz, at the Humboldt in Berlin, and at the Institute for Polish Jewish Studies at Oxford. From 1987 to 1991, can I ask you to stop chatting in the audience, please? From 80, 1987 to 1991, he was a research fellow at the German Historical Institute in Warsaw, and from 1987 to 1988, he served as research director of a clandestine Eastern archives, which collected materials about Polish deportees to the Soviet Union after 1939. He serves on the advisory board of Poland, a journal of Polish Jewish studies, and he has authored or co-authored seven books and fully 75 scholarly articles. His most recent work is The Origins of Modern Polish Democracy, published by Ohio University Press in 2010. But Piotr is much more than even this. He is a deeply humane scholar who brings both long personal experience and a deep reservoir of sympathy for his co the country of his birth and study. Piotr knew and worked with dissident scholars, indeed he was one, and activists during the dark days of communist rule, and he brings to Poland an affection, indeed a love, that is, frankly, contagious. He, like I, and indeed the Monk School, are deeply committed to Poland at its best. A country that survived great power partition, the horrors of a German war of extermination, and Soviet domination. A country with a diverse and powerful civil society, and a country committed to European values, democracy, the rule of law, and its place at the very center of the European Union. And, and this is not to be underestimated, he has an old world European charm, which is sadly increasingly rare these days. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you my colleague and my friend, Piotr Vrobel. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. Randall, you are too generous, too generous. Thank you very much. The centennial celebrations of the revival of the Polish state are very important to the Polish people. Most of them believe that if Poland did not recover its independence in 1918, Poland would not exist today as a separate nationality. This is why my chair, the Konstanty Reynert Chair of Polish Studies at the History Department of our university and the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policies decided to organize a special lecture devoted to this anniversary. We also looked for a special lecturer and we found our perfect choice in Professor Timothy Gratunash. He's the author of 10 books, the most recent one, Free Speech, 10 Principles for a Connected World, published by Yale University Press in 2016, sparked an international debate, received numerous prestigious awards, and has been translated into more than 20 languages. I recommend to you the 13 language website freespeechdebate.com, directed by Timothy Gatonash and connected to his book. 
Timothy Gartonash is a professor of European studies uh, at Oxford University, the Isaiah Berlin professor, professorial fellow at St. Anthony's College in Oxford, and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. The specialist on European history, contemporary culture, and global politics, he sometimes introduces himself as a historian of the present. But as one of his prominent reviewers put it, he had also become a historian of the future. <laughs> Professor Gartonash is not only a prominent member of the international academic community, but his regular writings contribute to the popular and cultural discor discourse on Europe, the European Union, and politics more broadly. He writes a weekly column for The Guardian, contributes to the New York Review of Books, and writes for the Financial Times, the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. In 2005, the journal's prospect and foreign policy listed him among 100 top global public intellectuals. And Time magazine called Timothy Gartonash as one of the 100 most influential people worldwide. Next to numerous awards, he is a recipient of the Order of Merit from Germany, Poland, the Czech Republic, and the British Most Distinguished Order of St. Michael and St. George. I would like to close this introduction on a personal note. I belong to the Solidarity Generation. The events of 1981 and martial law in Poland were the formative experiences of my life. I revisit them frequently and I remember them well. I recall that we used to read Timothy Garton Ash's text published in Underground, looking for psychological support and confirmation that we had been doing right things. We were very grateful to him that he followed Poland's struggle for democracy. The Polish liberal intelligentsia is grateful to him for the same time, for the same thing now, for his continuous defense of Polish democracy. The recent example of it is Jesus Rex Polonia, an article published in the summer issue of the New York Review of Books. Please welcome Professor Timothy Gartonash. Thank you very much, Mark. Well, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Um, I'm not sure if we can deliver on the old world charm, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here again at the University of Toronto and at the Monk School, um, um, which is a kind of home from home for me, and I'm, I'm honored to be a, a, a fellow of the center. Now, my title is White Eagle, Red Background, a Centennial of Polish Independence, or you could say a centenary of Polish independence, a century of Europe. And this makes the first important but very obvious point, which is we are not talking about a century of Polish independence, because there was not a continuous century of Polish independence. There's been a century of Europe, but strictly speaking, Poland has only been truly independent for 50 of those 100 years. Uh, if we count 21 years for interwar Poland and roughly speaking 29 years of independent Poland since the Polish eagle got back his crown on the 29th of December 1989, because as we all know, in communist Poland, his crown was removed. Uh, in the period of the Polish People's Republic, so-called, 
uh, Poland was not a fully independent country. Uh, Norman Davis, writing in 1982, with perhaps uncharacteristic understatement, wrote that the Polish People's Republic, I quote, lacks many of the essential attributes of independence, which indeed it did. Um, I myself, uh, as, as you mentioned, have been following Poland closely, participating in a sense in this story for 40 of those 100 years, and I, I'm going to focus to some extent on, on what I know best. But let me start with a broader picture. I say white eagle, red background. What is the red in the background? Well, it's the red of blood, because there's a great deal of blood shed in those 100 years. It's the red of communism, because communism shapes and distorts Polish history, actually really for half that period. It's not just the strictly speaking 40 years of the People's Republic, because in a sense you have to go back to the 17th of September 1939 when the Soviet armies uh, invaded Eastern Poland under the terms of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And it's a red of seeing red, that is to say of multiple interpretations, often angry interpretations of Polish history. And that, in a way, is my theme. My theme is not just the actual history of these 100 years, but the battle of interpretations of that history. Now, the first and obvious point to make is that Polish history over this 100 years is one of tremendous change, radical discontinuity, shifts between almost unrecognizable different periods, very different from what we like to call a normal country, like, for example, Canada, or some would have said England. Well, I'm not sure how normal <laughs> England is anymore, but <laughs> once upon a time. Um, Czesław Miłosz, in The Captive Mind, says at one point, I quote, the man of the East cannot take Americans seriously because they have never undergone the experiences that teach men how relative their judgments and thinking are. And he says, we live, all of us, like Charlie Chaplin, do you remember, in that uh, log cabin on the edge of the cliff in the gold rush, bustling around, laying the table, dusting the floor, as if he was living a perfectly normal life, but actually, He's on the edge of an abyss. And Miwash says, that's how we live all the time. And people who have experienced the tragic 20th century know that. But people who live in quote unquote normal countries, he calls them Americans. <laughs> Another question about a normal country. Uh, um, uh, I like Charlie Chaplin bustling around. So, so, so Poland one of the first thing it teaches us is the relativity of our judgments and our thinking, which we take to be absolute. And this goes to another point, which is that for much of its history, before we get to the more normal questions about what kind of a country and what its place is in Europe, there have been two prior questions. Whether Poland and where is Poland? So first of all, is there going to be a Poland at all? Because as Professor Brubo rightly pointed out, he used the term revival of Polish statehood in uh, 1918. But of course, for 123 years before that, there had not been a Poland as a state of its own on the map of Europe. Um, there's a very good Cambridge Concise History of Poland by Jerzy Lukowski and Hubert Zawadzki. Um, and they make the point in the introduction that pre-1795 Poland and post-1918 Poland, the First Republic and the Second Republic, although there was an attributed and assumed and a desired continuity, actually feel like such completely different countries. And yet, 
the nation survived without a state. Nations do not depend for their survival on having a state. The question whether Poland has now been answered, I hope for good. But then there was a question, where is Poland? The French playwright Alfred Jarry wrote in 1896 a play called Ubu Roi, King Ubu, and the stage direction at the beginning says, the action of this play takes place in Poland, that is to say, nowhere. 1896, not a place on the map of Poland. In 1918, as the historians know very well, the question of where is Poland was still very much unresolved. The great Polish writer Maria Dombrowska in a book called O Zjednoczone Polsce on united or reunited Poland, published in 1919, says, I quote, our frontiers, we've almost forgotten them. When we say Poland, Poland, we don't even know what territory we mean, where it ends, how far it extends. The question was temporarily answered in the Treaty of Riga in 1921, but only, of course, until the double invasion of September 1939, Nazi and Soviet, when Poland reemerged as a semi-independent state in 1945, as most of you know, it had been shunted dramatically westward by a decision, by the fiat of the great powers, Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt. It earned the epithet quoted by Norman Davis, the nation on wheels. I have to tell you at this point a, a, a little anecdote on this. Um, in 1987, my wife, who is Polish, and I were invited to a state banquet in Buckingham Palace in honor of the then president of the Federal Republic, Richard von Weizsäcker. And what happens at a state banquet at, at Buckingham Palace is that after dinner, a courtier sidles up to you and says, Princess Margaret has expressed a special desire to meet you. And you think, oh, that's very nice, that's very flattering. <laughs> Maybe she read something I've written. And then it turns out that every single person uh, has been assigned to some minor member of the royal family <laughs> who's expressed a special desire to meet whoever it is. So, it wasn't there. so, there we, so we queue up, we queue up, and there is Princess Margaret leaning on the grand piano, smoking a cigarette, um, and looking incredibly bored. <laughs> and uh, we're introduced, and she says to my wife, Danuta, yeah, where do you come from? And Danuta says, from Poland. And Princess Margaret says, oh, we were just talking with the German president about how funny it must be to be have your country constantly moving to and fro like this. <laughs> <laughs> My wife had to restrain herself <laughs> physically assaulting a member of the British royal family. How funny, talking to the German president. But of course, even then, the frontier on the Odenaisa line had not fully and finally been recognized. So the question, where is Poland, had not been decided. Uh, and as you all very well know, it was a passionate cause for the People's Republic, and particularly for Władysław Gomułka, the post-56 leader of communist Poland, to get full and final recognition of the Odenaisa line. There was actually a rather good joke uh, um, in Poland in the 1960s, which was that um, People were very concerned about nuclear war at that time, and, and after a nuclear holocaust, there were only two people left on the entire planet. And they were Władysław Gomułka and a West German nun. The West German nun, after very, very long and somewhat agonized prayer, approached Mr. Gomułka and said that, Mr. Gomułka, I, I've consulted the Almighty, and, um, and I really feel that, that for the sake of the future of humanity, we should, you know, do something about the future of humanity. 
and Gomulka goes off in a sulk, um, doesn't pray exactly, but thinks very hard, and then he comes back and he says, okay, I agree, so long as you recognize the Odenaisa line. <laughs> um, it was a joke, but the fact is, in the negotiation of German unification in 1989-1990, the question of the finality of the Odenaisa line of the frontier of Poland was again raised by Helmut Kohl, the German chancellor. Now, he told me, Kohl, uh, uh, when, when I interviewed him for a book of mine on, on German Ostpolitik, and I absolutely believe him, that what he was doing was actually a deliberate maneuver because he knew that the hard right of his party and particularly the so-called Vertriebene, the representatives of those people who'd been expelled from the German territories that were now part of Poland, he had to show them that it was a complete no-hoper. There was absolutely no way in which you were gonna get the unification of East and West Germany if you raised that question again. And so he was, in a sense, inviting the slapdown that he then, of course, got from the French, the British, the Americans, and, and everybody else. But nonetheless, the question was raised, and it is only at that point, only in 1990, that the question, where is Poland, was actually definitively answered in international law. And let's hope it isn't raised again for a very long time. So, Definitely not a normal country where the question whether Poland and the question where is Poland is open for so long. The questions, however, that still remain open, as they do for many other questions, is what is Poland? What kind of Poland? In the famous phrase of the historian Joachim Lelewel, Polska tak, ale jaka? Poland, yes, but what kind of Poland? How does it understand its role, its mission? What is its place in Europe? How will it revolve the old tension that goes right the way through modern Polish history between the national aspirations and the social aspirations, social and political aspirations of different parts of, of Polish society, the tension between the national and social? And who is a Pole? not the only country which wrestles with the question, who is a Brit, who is a German, who is French. But Poland is in this very peculiar situation where, thanks to Hitler and Stalin, thanks to the horrors of the 20th century, it became a quite exceptionally mono-ethnic quite exceptionally, quite differently from its earlier history. In the 1992 census, 98% of people identify themselves as Polish, 98%. Tiny, tiny minority identification. Now, we can go into the question of identification and self-identification, but that's a very exceptional uh, figure. The question of Polish-Jewish relations is, of course, a very tense and complex one. Uh, there is now a much larger Ukrainian population, and the issue of immigration, and in particular Muslim immigration, is now one of the hottest topics in Polish politics. Uh, is it possible to be a Jewish Pole? Is it possible to be a British Pole? Is it possible to be a Ukrainian Pole? Is it possible to be a Muslim Pole? The question is still posed. So. It's a question of identity. What is Poland? What is its place in Europe? Now, identity, as you all know, is always some combination of how I see myself and how others see me, how my group sees itself, my nation sees itself, and how others see us. And in both those things, the self-identification and the image in the eyes of others, there's a tremendous duality of perceptions of Poland. This is very well pointed out in a book by a distinguished uh, historian uh, of the 1960s and 70s, Stefan Kniewicz, 
in A History of Poland, published in 1979, so still under the censorship of the People's Republic of Poland, but actually making a lot of very good points. And he, and he points out this contested, this duality, this almost schizophrenia between the image of the Christ among nations, the familiar romantic messianic image of Poland from the 19th century, and the image of hopeless chaos and anarchy. The, Im Im the image of the antemurule Christianitas, the bulwark of Christianity, and a quite different image of a Poland as a bridge between East and West, North and South, the place where multiple ethnicities and cultures meet, the Jagiellonian idea. And we have that duality running through so much of the writing about Poland by Poles and by people outside. Um, this was illustrated, you mentioned um, my book on the history of solidarity. You will very well remember that there was a famous and unforgettable song at that time sung by Jan Pieczak, the cabaret singer. Uh, the, 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 the refrain of which was, Żeby Polska była Polską, so that Poland should be Poland. Uh, and it was, it was a tremendous, it was an anthem of that time. The original version that he wrote was Żeby Polska była Polska, so that Poland should be Polish, which is a slightly different emphasis. And I had to think about this recently when I discovered that Jan Pieczak is now a publicist and very eloquent supporter of the nationalist right in Poland, and maybe that was somewhere present in the difference between Polska and Polską. Konstanty Gebert, a writer who some of you will know, observed, and this comes back to Miłosz, that when Americans say that's history, they mean it's completely irrelevant, doesn't matter, that's history. He said, when Poles say that's history, they mean it's the most important thing. <laughs> and this is now what I want to turn to in thinking about the way we and people in Poland think about Polish history, not just as what actually happened and its legacy and its consequences, but the interpretation and the evaluation. That is to say, about the relationship between history on the one hand and narrative on the other. So have in mind those two terms as we go on, history and narrative, and how we can bring those two terms into some reasonable relationship. I have stressed the exceptionalism of the Polish experience, and a very fine contemporary historian, Włodzimierz Borodzie, in his history of 20th century Poland, puts a question mark over that. He says, you know, if you look at Finland or you look at Ireland, they too have fairly exceptional histories. And actually, it's true that almost every European nation thinks of itself as exceptional, has written its history in terms of exceptionalism, measured against some pattern of normality. So for example, much of German historiography is about the German Sonderweg, the special way of German history, contrasted with a normality represented by Britain and France. But British historians write the history of Britain as an exceptional history, contrasted with the normality of continental European countries. So exceptionalism is always relative. If everyone is exceptional in some sense, no one is. But what I would say about Poland history is I'd like to adapt a rather humorous remark of Isaiah Berlin who like to say that the Jews are just like other people, only more so. <laughs> and I would like to say that Poland is just like other European countries, only more so. That is to say that while the basic periodization of Polish history through those hundred years is entirely comparable with that of other countries, in each one of the four main periods, there's a particular intense version of what other European countries were going through. I mean, of course, roughly speaking, 1918 to 1939, 1939 to 1945, the Second World War, 
what we conventionally call the post-war period, which I would date from 1945 to 1989, 1990, and then what I like to call the post-wall period, as in the Berlin Wall from 1989 to today. And what we see is a sort of triple axis. There's a change in both the content and the interpretation of what Poland is and what Poland stands for through those periods, so chronologically. And then there's a constant contestation between external and domestic, external and internal views of Poland, and then within Poland itself, what Poland is, what it stands for, how it understands its history, is contested domestically. Now, in the period 1945 to 1989, that contestation was particularly sharp because we had to do with a truly Orwellian distortion, misinterpretation, systematic misinterpretation of the modern history of Poland by the Soviet Union and the Polish communist regime. And the big lie was, of course, focused on the brutal murder of Polish officers, of the elite of the Polish officer corps in Katyn in 1940. And it, it's a, one of the most brilliant and perfect encapsulations of the Orwellian big lie because it all depends very simply on one date, in fact, on one number, 1941 versus 1940. So the claim was it was 1941, and it was the Germans what done it, and not 1940 and the Russians, and the, 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 the Stalinists. The first time I went to Poland in 1979, I visited the Church of St. Anthony, my college is St. Anthony's College in Oxford, in Warsaw, and in the cloister, if you're ever in Warsaw, go and have a look, there were already at that time the, the, the graves or the tombstones, more accurately, of a number of Polish officers which put the place of death as Katyn and the date of death as 1940. In the cloister, that was possible. You couldn't publish it. You couldn't put it out there in the public sphere, but in the cloister it was possible. And I thought that was wonderful. So I was taking photographs, and a monk came up and rather excitedly dragged me along to see more um, memorial tablets with those dates, Katyn 1940. Now, at that time, I didn't speak Polish, and he didn't speak anything else. Um, so communication was a little bit difficult, but I really wanted to get across what I was feeling at that time. And finally, I thought, well, he must have some Latin. So I said, and I hope your Latin is up to this, <laughs> fortis est veritas et praeva labis. Truth is strong and will prevail. And he nodded very excitedly and smiled and took me to see more memorial tablets of Catine 1940. Fortis est veritas et praeva labis, and sure enough, after 1989, it did prevail, but it didn't bring us through into a golden age when everything was simple facts were undisputed. It brought us into another age, which we're still living in, of very complex contestation of what happened in the Polish past and the meaning of what happened in the Polish past. A contestation both from inside and from outside, because it's important to say, and this is my next point, that the idealization of Poland, and I think this is very characteristic for Poland, the romantic idealization of Poland is not just something that comes from inside Poland. It comes quite often from people outside Poland, outside observers. There are very few countries which have such friendly, such supportive, such idealizing outside observers. A very fine Polish poet, Adam Zagajewski, wrote a wonderful poem in published in a, vo a volume published in 1983 called Wiesze o Polsce, Verses on Poland. I won't quote the whole thing, but he says how he loves reading poems about Poland 
written particularly by Russian and German poets. I'm going to read a little bit of it in Polish. How many people speak Polish? Put your arms up. Okay, enough to read you a bit of Polish poetry, and then I will give a poor translation. So he, he reflects on this, on this unicorn which he sees in these poems by Russian and German poets, which is beautiful, weak, uh, and sensitive. And then he writes, I quote, Nie wiem, na czym polega mechanizm złodzenia, ale i mnie, czy zwego czytelnika, zachwyca ten baśniowy, bezbronny kraj, którym żywią się czarne oły, głodny sezarze, czecza rzesza i czeczy rzym. He says, I don't know what the mechanism of illusion is, but even I, a sober reader, can be fascinated and carried away by this fabulous, defenseless country being eaten by black eagles, that's Prussia, black eagles, hungry emperors, the Third Reich and the Third Rome. It's magnificent absolutely magnificent. And this image of the noble unicorn um, being devoured by the hostile powers runs through the work also of historians. Let me just quote to you briefly a few of the comments made about Poland by distinguished historians. Oskar Halecki, one of the really most widely read histories of Poland, first published in 1943, I quote from the 1978 edition. He writes, we have examined often with a passionate interest everything which has seemed able to enlighten us on the providential mission that Poland has, as well as might be, fulfilled in the general evolution of humanity. Providential mission. Norman Davies, signing off on his history, God's Day, uh, God's Playground, the preface is uh, 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 dated the 3rd of May, 1979, significantly. He says, Poland is a repository of ideas and values. I quote again, a symbol of moral purpose in European life. But he also says in the 1982, uh, or in the, in the postscript, post-martial law, that Poland is back in its usual state of stabilized defeat. And in his Heart of Europe, 1983, he says Poland is back in its usual condition of political defeat and economic chaos. So again, you have this duali duality, the symbol of moral purpose in, mor in European life, but its usual condition of political defeat and economic chaos. Uh, Neil Asherson, another very fine writer about Poland, a beautiful writer, in his book, The Struggles for Poland, interprets, understands Polish history. This is written in, published in 1987. As I quote, a struggle to establish a truth. And he, he writes, what is being amount for amounts, in fact, to the minimum for a decent national life, a society free of external threat, whose political currency is truth, and whose citizens are free to combine on their own initiative for the improvement of their lives. End of quotations. Some minimum, I would say. So, we have this duality, this dichotomy, ambitious romantic projections onto Poland, but also very sober pessimistic analyses. Actually, when I look at the work of contemporary Polish historians, I mentioned already Lukowski and Zawadzki, uh, Wojciech Borodzie, another fine book by Andrzej Paczkowski, there's a much more sober and realistic assessment of the complexities of Polish history and its real place in, in European history. And Borodzie makes an interesting point which I want to develop. He says, there were three moments in the 20th century when we could argue that Poland wrote European history, had an impact well beyond its frontiers, wherever those frontiers might be. They were, he argues, 
1920, the miracle on the Vistula, uh, the Polish armies driving back the advancing Red Armies. If he argues the Red Armies had got to Berlin, European history in the 20th century could have looked very different. Secondly, September 1939, the beginning of the Second World War and Poland's resistance to Nazi Germany. And he argues, we could talk about this maybe, but he argues that there was a real alternative, which was that Poland would have made some sort of a separate peace with Nazi Germany. Uh, there were, as you very well know, dil diplomatic initiatives in that direction from the German side and turned together against the enemy in the East, against the Soviet Union. And he argues, I think, persuasively that European history would again have looked very different if Poland had made a different decision. I imagine, I hope, those two are relatively uncontroversial. I want to dwell on his third moment when, argues Borodze, Poland wrote European history. And that is the period which he dates from 1980 to 1989, the period associated with Solidarność, the Solidarity Movement. I would actually date it from 1979 to 1989. It seems to me absolutely clear that this period begins with the election of the Polish Pope, Karol Wojtyła, to be Pope John Paul II, and with his extraordinary first pilgrimage to his native land in the summer of 1979. And I want to argue that in this period, Poland did something new, not just in Polish history, not just in European history, but actually in world history. And that it should be a source of national pride, of shared national pride for all Poles, similar to the national pride that all Brits take in the 1940 moment when Churchill and Britain stood up virtually alone against Nazi Germany, and that it is actually a tragedy of our time that far from being a shared source of national pride for all Poles and the story they tell to Europe, it is itself a source of fierce and highly partisan controversy. So first of all, why is it such a unique contribution in the terms both of Polish, European, and world history? Well, first of all, because already with John Paul II, you have an overcoming of one of the deep divides in modern Polish history between a conservative national Catholic church and what Adam Michnik fav famously called the Lewica Laicka, the secular left, uh, a divide that goes through the Polish 20th century. And Cardinal Wojtyła, subsequently John Paul II, in linking the Polish national story to a claim for universal God-given human rights as also codified in the International Declaration of Human Rights and in the Helsinki Agreements. And this was the great shift in the language of the Polish church in the 1960s, enabled that great divide to be overcome. And if you look at his fantastic cycle of sermons in his pilgrimages to Poland, he clearly builds that bridge. But the second divide that was overcome when inspired by the post Pope's great pilgrimage to his native land, the Solidarity Movement was born in August 1980, were the social divides which had so often helped to defeat the national insurrections for in Polish independence. Three great forces in Polish society the workers, the peasants, farmers, and the intelligentsia, that really distinctive social class, came together in the solidarity movement, united against the communist power. And that again was a first in, Europe, in Polish and indeed actually in East European history. That gave the solidarity movement its special character, its strength, but beyond that, when Solidarity came back 
1988, 1989. And by the way, just to illustrate this unique relationship between the workers, the peasants, and the intelligentsia, I was actually in the Lenin shipyard in May 1988. I was smuggled in by one of the dock workers um, during the occupation strike in May 1988, um, which was one of the first um, sort of significant uh, revivals of solidarity also as a workers' movement, uh, and one of the impulses which led the communist regime, along with Western sanctions and the economic difficulties, to the negotiations that came to the round table. And I was smuggled over the wall of the shipyard and under a couple of unbuilt um, uh, container ships and into the headquarters of the strike, where I found Lech Wałęsa laid out asleep on the floor in his carpet slippers. And Tadeusz Mazowiecki, his intellectual advisor, and one or two others, waiting for the leader to awake. And finally, the leader awoke, laid off his slippers, and said, what are we going to do? Because it was quite clear that the strike was not going to succeed as it had in August 1980. They weren't strong enough. And um, so Mazowiecki said, well, you tell us what we're going to have to do. And um, Bawensa said to Mazowiecki, well, no, no, I think you need to negotiate. Pan jest od negociacji. Pan jest od mądroszy. You're the man for negotiations. You're the man for wisdom. And it was a wonderful illustration of the relationship between the workers and the intellectuals. You're the intellectuals. You've got to go and negotiate with the communist uh, authorities. But actually, of course, Rowenza was being very clever because he didn't want to take responsibility for the compromise that had to be made. But anyway, as a result, partly of the revival of solidarity, but also, as I say, because of the changing circumstances around, because of sanctions, because of Gorbachev, this led to that complicated dance that led to the negotiations at the round table in the spring of 1989, which ended with an agreement not only on the re-legalization of the solidarity movement, but also on the country's first semi-free election for 40 years. Uh, semi-free because not all the seats were up for contest contestation. Some of the seats were reserved for representatives of the party state. And that led, of course, to the semi-free election of the 4th June 1989, which I was privileged to witness, in which solidarity absolutely swept the board, got virtually every seat they could have got. And that day was, in fact, as we saw subsequently, the end of communism in Poland. Now, the fact of the round table and the negotiations at the round table are, as many of you know, now a subject of fierce political controversy and sinister accusations inside Poland. I believe it was one of the greatest innovations, not just in Polish, but in European history, because what it actually pioneered was a new kind of revolution, a peaceful revolution. Revolution since 1789 through 1917 had always been associated with revolutionary violence. Starting with the Polish Revolution of 1980-81, the unsuccessful revolution, but all the way through to in 1989, people like Bronisław Geremek, the very distinguished historian and solidarity advisor, were determined to try to invent a new kind of revolution in which you would achieve a revolutionary outcome that is to say, a rapid and fundamental change of the political system, which they did achieve, but without the revolutionary violence, which was undesirable on moral and consequential grounds, because as Adam Michnik observed, we've learned from history 
that those who start by storming the Bastille will end up building a Bastille themselves, but also was totally unrealistic. In the context, let me remind you, where there were still a million Red Army troops in the center of Europe, many of them in East Germany to the west of Poland, and in which you were still dealing with a nuclear armed superpower, which had by no means declared that it was just gonna give up its empire without a shot fired in anger. Um, the formula they found, political scientists call it a pacted transition, a negotiated revolution, but a negotiated revolution with the force of a mass movement behind it, a mass movement inviting mass, mass of the nation, was a unique formula subsequently emulated elsewhere in East Central Europe, in Hungary, in East Germany, uh, in Czechoslovakia as it then was. They too had their round tables, but it was Poland which invented the model of the round table. Poland was the icebreaker for the end of communism in Eastern Europe, it punched the first hole in the Berlin Wall. It contributed most to the end of the division of Europe that we know in Yalta. It opened the door for Poland becoming again a liberal democracy, becoming a member of NATO in 1999, of the European Union in 2004. Should not that be a source of shared national pride for all Poles? But it isn't. It's a subject of hyper-polarized political debate and controversy and con conspiracy theory. To quote Adam Zagajewski once again from the same volume, looking at the heroic behavior of Poland under martial law, he wrote, and I quote again, Naprawdę umiemy żyć dopiero w klasie. Oby nie zaskoczyło nas zwycięstwo. Truly, we only seem able to live in defeat. Let's hope we're not surprised by a victory. Writes Zagajewski, ironically, in 1983. And Poland was surprised by a victory. And actually, it did pretty well in substance, but for this so familiar falling apart of Polish society and politics in the result. And one small symptom of this is something that happened recently, which I find so shocking I have to remember, uh, remember it, because Bronisław Geremek was truly the great strategist of the solidarity movement. He was a rare example of a historian who makes history. And a few days ago, a memorial tablet was unveiled on what is now called Geremek Square in central Warsaw, and a rather um, handsomely worded uh, inscription had been prepared. And the head of a department at the Institute for National Memory, IPN, wrote a letter complaining about the wording of the inscription and suggesting some alterations, um, which were, amongst other things, first of all, that it should not say uh, in honor of Holger, because that should be reserved for people who'd actually fought. Secondly, if he should, it should not say that Bronisław Geremek was a co-architect of democratic Poland. Well, he was a co-architect of democratic Poland. That it should not say that he was a European, or a Pechikian. I mean, truly incredible. I mean, Bronisław Geremek one of the great Europeans of our time. And to have that small-minded, petty suggestion seriously put on the table was truly shocking. I'm glad to say the changes were not made and the tablet is as originally worded. But I do want to emphasize, because I'm not making in any sense a partisan point. I belong to no political party of any kind, not even in Britain, let alone in Poland. I'm not making a partisan point. I do want to emphasize that my friends, Geremek, Mazowiecki, and others, who were so instrumental in the pacted transition, in the new model of, uh, of peaceful revolution, did, in my view, make one serious mistake. And that was 
in their keenness to bridge the painful divides that had emerged from martial law from the 1980s, to get everyone together in a big tent to go about rescuing the economy, which at that time was a basket case, um, to go forward towards a, um, uh, a better democratic Poland, they consciously made the decision not to have any public reckoning or confrontation with the communist past. And I don't mean by that what's called lustratia or decommunizatia. I don't mean the, the, the business of, of literally taking down communists. I mean what I say, some public reckoning with the communist past, something like a truth commission. And I think that was a great omission, and my conclusion is that if you have a velvet revolution, you should be sure to have a truth commission. Because the problem with velvet revolution, with negotiated revolution, is that it inevitably involves painful compromises in which corrupt representatives of the old regime who did bad things are somehow left um, without a judicial reckoning. Some are left in, in power. And in particular, part of the deal in 1989 across Eastern Europe was that you trade the political power which you peacefully give up for a possibility of winning economic power, of getting in at the beginning and getting rich in the transition to capitalism. And that was a painful compromise. But particularly if you're going to do that, and if you don't have the revolutionary catharsis which is a typical feature of, 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 as it were, classical revolution of 1789 or 1917. I actually talked about this with Geremek, who, amongst other things, was the historian of, of France. Then you need some way of symbolically, publicly, drawing a line between the bad past and the better future. And I don't believe myself that it was necessarily the right way to go about it to Hall Jaruzelski in front of, or Kishtak in front of courts for, for the rest of their lives. But what I do think is that they should have been hauled in front of a truth commission. And there should have been a public moment of reckoning with the communist past, and they should have been compelled to testify. And in that way, you should have drawn a clear line. You remember, Mazowiecki fav famously said, Groba Kreska, a thick line said to have set a thick line. Actually, I would have been in favor of a thick line, but a thick line of that kind between the bad past and the better future. Because what the lack of any public confrontation with the communist part did was to open the door for a politica historichna, a historical policy or historical politics, which was based on a narrative of the revolution betrayed. The revolution betrayed in 1989 that this was a corrupt deal behind closed doors between the pink and the red, between the secular left and the communists, the ex-communists and the communists, and it wasn't really the beginning of independent Poland, and independent Poland only really begins in 2015, and then the, the idea of the Fourth Republic and so on and so forth. Now, I don't want to go in great detail to that controversy, but that it is that contested nature of the transition from very early on, from the 1990s, which robs Poland of that wonderful story that I think it could have told and could still tell about its place in European history. A, a story which combines the battle for independence, Niepod Legwas, the freedom of the nation and the freedom of the individual, with its contribution to European history. A story which successfully combines history in all its contested complexity and narrative, the narrative that countries need. And I have to tell you that I thought on the 25th 
anniversary of 1989, that Poland was actually getting there, that Poland was becoming one of the top leading six powers within the European Union. It was increasingly influential in the European Union. It stood not only for its own interests, for certain values, it was a voice for freedom and human rights, and it had a particular contribution to make to the foreign policy, to the external policy of the European Union, which was, of course, its eastern policy, because one of the areas where independent Poland since 1989 had a great continuity was in its eastern policy. Its policy not just towards Russia, but in particular towards the lands between, towards Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, and the Baltic states. And this policy was the policy of the exile journal Kultura. It was the policy of Jerzy Giedrych. And if you ever think exile intellectuals and emigre intellectuals don't matter, take heart from the story of Kultura. Because this small emigre magazine actually made the foreign policy of Poland for 25 years. And all Polish governments after 1989 followed the policy of Kultura, which was to build up the independent countries between what was now Poland and what was now Russia. I thought that was a great story to tell. Unfortunately, in the last three years, and I lament this greatly, this has been supplanted by an official nationalist mythopoeic narrative which yields to the temptation which all nations have only to remember all the good things and heroic things about their past and not the bad ones. Well, let me tell you, all of us have some bad things in our past. All of us, certainly the Brits do. And we have now seen the attempt to impose in scholarship and also by law, in the amendment to the EPN law, a specific nationalist narrative in which Poland claims only the good parts of its past and does not address the difficult chapters of its history. The Polish-Jewish relationship in all its great complexity, which you've written about so eloquently, the Polish-Ukrainian relationship, to some extent the Polish-Russian relationship. That amendment to the law on the Institute of National Memory was explicitly justified as defending, I quote, the good name of Poland in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing has done more damage to the good name of Poland in the world than that amendment to the law. It has had, it, it, it has had precisely the opposite effect. Uh, and, and by the way, provoked commentaries from France, from the United States and elsewhere, which themselves have been very unfair and which themselves have reviled, uh, revived old simplistic stereotypes about, for example, Polish anti-Semitism and so on. That's also important to say, but, but they were provoked precisely by that, by that amendment. Poland, and this is my conclusion, the Polish story of the last hundred years, ladies and gentlemen, does not need to be defended by a memory law. It does not need to be defended by an institute of national memory or simplistic narrative uh, told by a government. With all its more difficult chapters, it remains one of the most remarkable stories in the European history of the last 100 years. And part of that story is how free countries live with and face up to the more difficult chapters of their past. How free countries allow the free contest of historical interpretations, not as an expression of political partisanship, but as an expression of the genuine battle of ideas and the contest of historical interpretations advanced by scholars and journalists and writers and filmmakers. Poland has a good story to tell and the best thing about it is, it's a true story too. Thank you very much. 
Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much again for your lecture. And now I would like to ask you several heavy questions. There you go. And since you are a historian of the past and historian of the present, let me concentrate on the contemporary Europe, contemporary situation. Of course, we could talk about 1920 and World War One, but, but I would prefer to talk about things which are important to all of us. And uh, I will be a bit personal in this. So after 1989, many Poles believed that Poland had entered a completely new path, a path of liberal democracy, Europeization, opening to the world, and that Poland would stay on this path. Now, after 2015, some of us are afraid that this was just an episode. Are we too pessimistic? You're a historian, and um, so you know perfectly well that we don't know. <laughs> you, are, you are a historian of the future? I'm not a historian of the future. I've never made that claim. A historian of the present may be. No, but I mean, it is rather important to say. Um, we have political scientists for that, so they know what that <laughs> That was unkind. We have, we have pundits, too. Um, so um, I, we genuinely don't know, but let me say a couple of things about that. I mean, the first thing is that the, 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 another characteristic of, 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 of the Poland's peaceful revolution, as of the other ones in East Central Europe, is that they were rather peculiar in what they were aspiring to. They were aspiring to be like, quote unquote, normal countries. And by normal countries, they meant West Germany or France or Britain. Uh, Jürgen Habermas called it the Nachholender Revolution, the revolution of catching up. So it was a very unusual kind of revolution in that its model, where it wanted to go, were was existing societies just next door in Europe. And that was a huge advantage. Marcin Krull, who some of you will know, well-known historian of ideas, wrote a, an interesting book recently called Belish Migwupi. We, we, we were stupid. Uh, we can talk about that, but, um, um, but, but he says interestingly in there, since the 1960s, when I thought about how I wanted Poland to be, I thought I wanted it to be a normal country. And having a normal country meant, you know, West Germany, Britain, France. So having that really clear model, which not only was a model, but also was prepared to help you on the path to become more like a Western democratic capitalist uh, country and eventually join the European Union was a huge asset, a huge asset. The problem came when mission was accomplished. And you'd become a liberal democracy and a market economy and you were in NATO and you were in EU. And then what was it all going to be about? And what I see happening in Poland now is that the many, many discontents that there were building up in Polish society as a result of the transition some of them socioeconomic. I mean, there were real socioeconomic differences between people in the cities who've done well and people in small towns in the countryside who've done less well, but also cultural resentments uh, and ideological differences uh, and fears about Europeanization meaning secularization. Um, gender has become a Polish word, as you know. The Polish Catholic Church is battling gender all those discontents were rather skillfully aggregated by the party of Jarosław Kaczynski, who is, amongst other things, a brilliant political entrepreneur, because like many populists, he managed to unite all these rather different social groups around a simplistic, emotionally appealing na nationalist narrative, and did that rather brilliantly. So that explains, I think, the success of peace, the electoral success of peace. I mean, I could say more about that, but that's part of the story. What happens next? Okay, so second point. What
what's happening in Poland is by no means unique to quote-unquote Eastern Europe. One of the bad things that has happened recently is that the old de haut en bas civilizational prejudices and stereotypes of Eastern Europe, which Larry Wolf described brilliantly in his book Inventing Eastern Europe, that East Europeans were never true Europeans. They were never really belonged to the European Enlightenment. These have rather rapidly come back. But actually, in that case, Donald Trump is an East European. <laughs> and <laughs> Nigel Farage is an East European. And Marine Le Pen and Matteo Salvini are East Europeans. Because these are phenomena, the, the po populism, nationalist populism, we're seeing all over the democratic world. The difference is this, that I still don't believe, I hope I'm not proved wrong, that what's happening in my country, in Britain, the Brexit populism, or even what's happening with Trump in the United States, is actually threatening the fundamentals of liberal democracy, yet. But because, not because it's Eastern Europe, but because liberal democracy in Poland and Hungary is still young and fragile, What's happening in Poland, as in Hungary, is actually threatening the fundamentals of liberal democracy. So I think we need to be really worried about it. And what happens next, neither of us know, but it depends on two actors above all, as always. The Poles themselves. Um, unlike in Hungary, where it's really very difficult to win an election, because Viktor Orban, using his constitutional majority, has changed the laws, changed the electoral laws, gerrymandered the constituencies, and controlled the media. In Poland, it is still absolutely possible for the opposition to win an election. There is still effective media pluralism. Fortunately, TVN, the big oppositional independent television channel, is, has American owners. Um, there are four elections upcoming in Poland over the next three years. Um, local, national, European, um, and presidential. Those elections are there for the winning, and it's up to the opposition to win them, right? They're not doing a great job at the moment. They're not doing a great job. We can talk about that if you like. But So the future is up to the polls, but it's also up to the European Union. And on this, I'll, I'll finish because I've talked too long in answer to your question, but it was a big question. You know, Poland is a member of the European Union. The European Union claims to be a union of values, of basic values, and above all, a community of law. The rule of law is being dismantled, is being eroded in Poland. There's no question about that. The successive changes and attacks on the judiciary are, and the Constitutional Court, now the Supreme Court, are eroding the rule of law. So far, the European Union has done nothing effective about it. It has, for the first time in its in history, activated the Article 7 process, but that's actually not going to lead anywhere because Hungary will veto it. Um, what's the fundamental problem? The fundamental problem is that the Europe of values is divorced from the Europe of money. So what is most peculiar to the historian about what's happening in Poland and Hungary is while these processes are happening, Poland and Hungary are receiving the largest financial transfers of any member states of the European Union. So the governments are being paid to bite the hand that feeds them. I mean, it's a most extraordinary situation. And what has to happen, and happen sooner rather than later, is that that linkage is re-established between the Europe of values and the Europe of money. Well, so let me a uh, similar question or connected to, to this, because what's going on in Poland right now, this is not only a matter of the government, but this is the society. Uh, President Duda has 68% support, etc., uh, etc. Et so let me ask you this question. When Central Europe joined the European Union in 2004, there were voices in the West saying that this was premature, that Central Europe was not ready for this, that the democratic tradition was too fragile, that there was no this community of values. And at that time, when we listened to these arguments, 
I mean when Central Europeans listened to these arguments, we were very angry about this. Um, but should the present situation change our perspective on that? Not a whit, not one bit. Uh, on the contrary, and people also, of course, even more said we shouldn't have enlarged NATO because that un, 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 upset Vladimir Putin and, and Russia, which is a complete nonsense because um, that, but that's a separate story. We can come to it if you like. Um, absolutely not. Poland fulfilled all the Copenhagen criteria, the quite rigorous criteria for membership of the European Union. There's absolutely no reason why a 15-year-old Polish democracy should not have joined uh, the European Union, as did a, let me think about it, less than 15-year-old Spanish and Portuguese democracy. They were new democracies after fascist dictatorships. Uh, uh, they too had had authoritarian and reactionary political cultures. Um, so that does not persuade me at all. What I think is worth thinking about is, first of all, that the liberal pro-European, in the broader sense, liberal pro-European elites in Poland post-1989 tended to see Europe as an end in itself rather than a means to a larger end. So that there was a kind of vacuum once you got into Europe and then you had to ask the question. For example, people didn't spend a lot of time explaining why we're going to change our laws or our legal system in this particular way. And I've talked to Polish lawyers and legal scholars who said, all, 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 all the professors and the, the judges and the ministers said was, we need to do it to get in the European Union. It was an end in itself. And so that there wasn't sufficient argument in substance about why these are good ways to do things. And that, I think, helps explain uh, some of the, 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 you know, the, 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 the kickback now. The second thing is that, um, um, and it connects the argument to my lecture, as you know, something like a million Poles came to the United Kingdom after the enlargement of the EU. Um, it, it delights me, by the way, because I can speak Polish in any restaurant in England. And, uh, you know, there'll be Poles on both sides of the counter. My wife and I used to have a secret language, but no longer. Um, but it's interesting, and I once asked the Polish ambassador if we have any indications how they vote. And interestingly, you might have thought these were young, energetic, well-educated, et cetera, et cetera, and so they would be voting for Platforma or you know, pro-European liberal parties. Not a bit of it. Um, the, all the indications are that a large number of them vote for peace and for nationalist parties. And then you have to ask why that is so, and also why it's not just you know, poor people in small towns and the countryside. It's also students of Warsaw University who support the nationalist right. And one possible way of thinking about this is that Poland is a very proud country, understandably proud of its, of its history. And then what it's done is to make a kind of copy of a West European consumer society, right? And there's nothing in particular in contemporary Poland or contemporary politics or the contemporary economy which you can point to, and that's to say something we can distinctively be proud of, right, arguably. And so people reach back to the past. You see students at uh, Warsaw University walking around with T-shirts with the name of battles from the Polish-Soviet War. A Jolnierz de Wiklenci, the, the accursed soldiers from the end of the Second World War, the great heroes. They're genuine heroes to young, to young Poles or to Poles living in Britain because it's something distinctively Polish that we can be proud of. So I think there's something, you know, there's something interesting there, and it connects to what I was trying to say, which is I do think that the post-communist, broadly speaking, liberal pro-European elites didn't do a good enough job about telling that distinctive story of what Poland brings to Europe. Well, you mentioned Article 7, 
the European Union's Executive Commission has taken Poland to the European Court of Justice over the overhaul of Poland's judicial system. And some Polish top governmental officials said that Poland would not respect a verdict of the Union's Supreme Court. What would be, in your opinion, the consequence of this refusal? Um. First of all, I don't believe it will actually come to that. I, I think there'll be, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, maneuvers and toing and froing. In a way, that is the problem with the whole process. Uh, the rule of law mechanism and now Article 7, which, as I say, will not come to the final crunch. The final crunch, for those of you who don't know, um, under Article 7 is that theoretically if a member state of the European Union is found to be fundamentally violating European values and the rule of law, its voting rights in the European Council, the, the crucial decision-making body, can be suspended. But that requires unanimity from all the other currently 27 member states of the European Union. Hungary would veto it. So it's not going to get to the point. But, but so Hungary will be out of this voting system as well. No, they won't be, because Poland will veto for Hungary, and Hungary will veto for Poland. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. Um, it, and, and so this goes to the point I'm making, which is that those mechanisms are extremely clunky and slow-moving and ultimately don't have great bite. What will have... And, and so I don't believe that it'll be an Armageddon moment. I really don't believe it'll be an Armageddon moment. And it's important to say that all through this period, in public opinion Poland, even where there's been very strong support, and there has been strong support, one has to acknowledge this, for, 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 for peace and for Duda, um, support for Poland's membership of the European Union has been rock solid at 80% plus, absolutely rock solid. So Pol Exit is not going to get the support of the, of, of, of the Polish people, and I think the peace government is aware of that, and there's a limit uh, to the extent where they can go up against. And when they didn't support Donald Tusk for president of the European Council, it actually really hit their popularity. So you're dealing with a fundamentally pro-European country. So I don't think that's, that's going to come to the crunch. What the European Commission has said, which you haven't yet mentioned, which is much more significant, is that in the two things. Number one, in the next round of the European budget, seven-year budget, uh, there's going to be a fundamental restructuring of the budget, and actually there'll be much less for the so-called structural funds, which is what's going to the poor regions of Poland. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to travel around Poland recently, but it's absolutely amazing. Wherever you go, every small town, a road is being built thanks to EU fund, the railway station is being restored, a school, a hospital, the town square. I mean, the, the transformation, the civilizational transformation thanks to EU fund is just enormous. Come the next budget, there's going to be less of that money. That's point number one. Point number two, and it'll be reassigned to things like... Um, integrating refugees coming from the Middle East and North Africa, because that's a concern, uh, and other purposes. Number two, the European Commission envisages a mechanism whereby if a country is actually found to be in violation, by the European Commission, found to be in violation of the Article 7 criteria, the money can be docked. They can literally stop the money coming. Now, that hasn't yet been agreed, but if that were agreed, I think that would be a very effective sanction. And I'm afraid, I'm sorry to have to say this, I don't want to cost Poland the, that money, but I think that's where you have to go, because it has to bite, it has to become real. But if we don't get the money, so let's go. Oh, so, so two, two, two things, uh, there are two parts to this. Number one, um, the overall amount will be less, but, but, but just bear in mind, Poland, over the last seven-year period, has got the largest chunk of money 
of any Euro EU member state in history. The, the, amount net amount, the amount of money it's got is roughly equivalent to the whole German net contribution. So it'll get less, but it'll still be a lot, okay? And, and then it will be of that remaining large sum of money. Um, uh, it was more than 50% of uh, Polish public investment. Amazing figures. Um, but I don't want to end on that note because I believe I would much, much rather, and I do believe, that Poland itself will come back to a more reasonable course. And again, I'm not for a moment questioning the absolute right of peace and of the elected Polish government to introduce its own policy. What you're not free to do is to change the rules of the game such that there's no longer a level playing field. You're not free to challenge the basic structures of liberal democracy. That would be to put in peril one of the really historic achievements of Polish history. Great, I think we'll have to stop there. All right, I, I would gladly ask you more questions. I saw, uh, I saw our chairman. But, uh, but uh, thank you very much for your answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Robel for some excellent chairing, and above all to Professor Timothy Gart Nash for a characteristically outstanding talk. Once again. <laughs> Professor Gart Nash mentioned that he is a Monk School Distinguished Fellow. We're very proud to have him, and I say to him, uh, this is your home, and we look forward to seeing you again sooner rather than later. Our Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy Distinguished Lecture Series will continue. Minister Catherine McKenna will be giving a talk, as will the President of Estonia. So do pay attention to our website, and we'll see you again. Thank you so much for coming. Good night.